Hey guys, I'm John and welcome to Respect Your Intellect. You voted for it? We're doing it. Bonus part of our 20 question series coming up. Let's get started. First off, I want to start by thanking everyone for voting for this bonus part. We were actually very slightly under the target, but a few of you had told me that you withheld pressing the like button to not subject me to any more Phuket. Although I appreciate the sentiment, it seems that most people wanted to see the final points covered, so we're gonna do that right now. I have a little something to confess first, though. At the end of part 4, I was so looking forward to not hearing Phuket word anymore that I was very quick at stopping the video. There was about 12 minutes left or so on his video, so I assumed that he would be answering the last few questions that I asked. Unfortunately, he just went into another one of his monologues and really only addressed the first question or two. So what I'll do for this bonus part is that I'll simply cover everything he said at the end. Just to put you in context, Everything he's going to be answering here has to do with if he finds it tiresome to always hear illogical answers to questions from the Flat Earth community and what made him get into it in the first place. So he starts off by saying that what's tiresome is hearing the same scientific explanations and excuses for not coming up with measurable proof and that scientific answers haven't been thought through and have alternative explanations. Alright, so there's quite a few things we need to address in this one point already. First, Scientific explanations about the shape of our planet won't change because they work and we've known that for over 2300 years, so he's just gonna have to get used to that. Second, nobody's making excuses in the scientific community about the shape of our planet because the only ones that can't measure the shape of our planet are the people who can't accept the results when they see it. If you want a really, really good example of that, be sure to check out my review on the Flat Earth Netflix documentary Behind the Curve. I'll leave a link in the description. And third, every alternative explanation for the shape of our planet was already explored and the only shape that can explain everything was determined to be a sphere about 1800 years ago. Any alternative explanation today for the shape of our planet is simply an exercise in futility. We have so many missions, satellites, probes, images, videos, observations, and predictions that arguing about the shape of our planet at this point is the equivalent of arguing that humans and animals can live without brains. He continues by saying that Flat Earth is something he had heard about and ignored for a long time, but that after hearing some of the Flat Earth arguments, he went out and did his own research. He said he measured the cooling effect of the moonlight, tried to find out what happens at the horizon, and he said he studied light. He said his results were that he realized that there is no demonstrable proof for anything for the globe, and that there are always alternative explanations and observations that are real, practical, and scientific. So let's start with his claim that moonlight has a cooling effect. The first thing that you realize often when you see these types of videos is that the experiment is not well controlled. For example, the object in the moonlight will often be unsheltered and will be subject to the elements like wind and cooler outside temperatures, while the other object will be shaded and sheltered, allowing it to retain more of its heat. So that right there invalidates most of these experiments. For the remaining ones that are well controlled, it's really not about the moonlight's heating or cooling effects, it's about radiative cooling. Radiative cooling is when the heat that we're constantly losing is not reflected back to us. So if you take two glasses of water where one is sheltered by cardboard, while the other one has an unobstructed view of space, the one with the cardboard will have more of its heat reflected back at it so it'll stay warm longer. This effect is pretty significant, and it can be felt by human skin on cloudless nights when you add an obstruction between you and space. This effect is responsible for sometimes causing frost or black ice on clear nights, even when the ambient temperature is still above freezing. Nocturnal ice making was also common in India before artificial refrigeration, as long as the ambient temperature wasn't too high above freezing. As for what he mentions about what happens at the horizon, he's not really looking for what happens at the horizon here. He's just trying to make up stories about it that makes absolutely no sense in reality, as we've already seen in the other parts where he mentions perspective, so I won't linger on this one any longer. Then for his claim about having studied light, I can honestly say that he doesn't know the first thing about what light is and how it behaves. He doesn't even believe that light travels in straight lines and that's one of the easiest things to observe. Not to mention that his claims about the sun would violate pretty much everything we know about light. And we live in a world that's pretty dominated by our mastery of light via lasers. 
So on this, you have a choice to either believe a random YouTuber like Phuket that never applies science correctly and never makes any sense, or science that gave you all your technology, a better quality of life, and a longer lifespan while always being consistent. So next he says that horizons are not curvature and that it's just an optical illusion. That's his excuse for everything. Even optical illusions have explanations, but he doesn't provide any that actually works. He simply makes statements as if they're facts, calls them scientific, and never accepts when his claims are falsified. He continues by saying the globe is based on looking at the sky and that we just imagined our planet being a sphere to explain day and night cycles that we experience. He adds that the spherical Earth is just a model and that it doesn't reflect our reality. So for this one, it just doesn't reflect his reality. Everyone else is happy with our precise astronomical predictions and our advancements in space travel. The geocentric model is a better example of what he's saying, where we couldn't imagine not being the center, so we added unobserved object to the model to explain the movements of observable bodies. It's the failure to ever observe these fictional objects that eventually led to the fall of the geocentric model in favor of one that didn't require any fictional objects to work. Simply put, it was a better explanation. Today, that's not even an argument anymore because we have a ton of stuff in space as well as many thousands of real pictures. Our knowledge about our universe is also pretty vast at this point, and that includes our planet, which is just a speck in the vastness of what we can explain. Next, he asks if there's anything in the world that we can do, like navigating oceans, that has to do with the spin or curvature, and he affirms that there isn't. That's pretty typical of a conspiracy theorist. Ask a question and close yourself up to the answer right as you ask the question. The answer though is that there are over 100,000 flights per day in 2019 that all travel with globe measurements, and everyone arrives at their destinations at the correct time and the correct place. On top of that, we could also add all the travel by sea as well as all the travel by land that are absolutely all using measurements on a globe. As for spin, that doesn't matter nearly as much, but many things still need to take that into account. For example, sunrises and sunsets are time based on our spin, Long-range ballistic missiles in the military need to account for the planet's spin, and astronomical predictions like eclipses are also taking the spin into account. Obviously, this list could go on for much longer too. After that, he says that everything on the ISS is fake, like wires, hairspray, and green screens, and that exposure is just an excuse for not seeing stars even when the sun's not there. So on this one, he's just doing like most other flat earthers, and he's using confirmation bias, which is about trying to find just one thing to prove your point regardless of how much more evidence there is to the contrary. They don't realize that NASA doesn't make its plans in function of Flat Earther's opinions. They sometimes add a few things here and there for video production that makes it more entertaining for children and stuff like that. What Flat Earthers don't do is take videos like the 20 minute uncut one where Chris Hadfield speaks with a grade 10 class and shows experiments with water. Zero gravity planes can't hold zero gravity for this long and the behavior of water in zero gravity planes is very different than on the ISS with microgravity. I'll leave a link to the 20 minute ISS video in the description. As for not seeing stars, exposure is not an excuse, it's a well-known fact. Even when the sun is not in the picture, the light reflecting off of the Earth or perhaps even the ISS itself greatly outshines the light coming from stars. Increasing the exposure to allow more light from the stars to hit the camera's image sensor will also allow an intense amount of light to come in from something else that's brighter and you'll lose those details if it just results in a pure white. I'll move on from this one for now, but feel free to check out deep sky astrophotography channels like Astro Backyard to learn more about how exposure works when taking pictures of things like nebulas with bright centers. The next thing he says is that we see further than we should on a globe, and that the 8 inch per mile squared formula didn't exist until flat earthers started investigating curvature. Well, whenever you think you see further than you should, it's usually one of three things. Either you don't realize that the bottom is hidden because you still see the top, or you don't account for refraction when you should, or you're calculating distances smaller than the margin of error of your experiment. These are probably one of the easiest things to debunk that comes from the flat earth community. As for the 8 inch per mile squared formula, that's just a formula that creates a parabola and it helps you make easy calculations for distances under 100 miles. 
For anything more than 100 miles, you can't use this formula because it doesn't form a circle and becomes more and more inaccurate as the distance grows. It was just meant to make an easy approximation that was still precise for short distances. Next, he says that not many people would disagree that politicians and governments lie. That's true, but they don't lie about things they have no reason to lie about, which is where we stop agreeing. The shape of the earth doesn't change anything to people's daily lives, and the governments wouldn't gain anything by lying about it. Not to mention that an incredible amount of people across thousands of years of history would have had to have lied as well. Then he says that scientists and engineers that are building satellites are not aware that the earth is flat, and that they're just working away doing a job and are simply led to believe that their satellites will go up in space. He adds that it's just a few people at the top that know the earth is flat and are keeping the secret, that all that's needed to carry out this deception is a TV in every home, that satellite data is faked in the form of CGI and pings then relayed between all the space agencies in the world, and that they're all doing this just for the money. Now this is pretty much as ridiculous as something can ever get. There's absolutely no motive to do this. It would require an enormous amount of taxpayer money that has to be approved by many people. And it would require that NASA always perfectly send back what's expected of each satellite with never an error in the making of the CGI or timing of the ping. There's absolutely zero chance that all scientists and engineers that ever worked on satellites would have accepted CGI without question. Something would have come up to blow it wide open and it would not have taken long. There's also no chance that something like this could be engineered by only a few people at the top because there's an entire pyramid of people that would be asking questions. Just think of all the discoveries that were made from satellites that led to other discoveries that resulted in other precise predictions. That just doesn't happen with fake stuff. Then he says that contrary to what people think, flat earthers demand science and measurable proof and don't want people to go back to the dark ages. On this one, I'll just point you again to my review on the Flat Earth Netflix documentary Behind the Curve, which shows exactly how empty his words are here. After that, he says that the advancement of technology is thanks in part to things like the Apollo missions, where downsizing technology was important, but that it doesn't mean we went to the moon. Now, I think this is only the second time in almost three hours of his videos that I can agree with. Having gone to the moon is beside the point though, because we don't really need to have gone there to know for sure that the earth is a globe. We knew it in 300 BC, over 2300 years ago, well before going to the moon. It's also worth noting that technology doesn't advance using fake data. And finally, he ends by saying that his answers to the question should give people an incentive to do their own research about flat earth and that they'll realize that they can't prove the globe. I'll tell you what my hope is here. I would hope that anyone who followed my 20 question series from beginning to end would realize that Flat Earth is nothing but a fictional story perpetrated by people willing to take advantage of others for a bit of extra income. The amount of evidence pointing to that is simply overwhelming. So thanks everyone for watching. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe buttons if you enjoyed the video. And you can also find links to my Twitter and Facebook in the description. Until next time, thanks for watching and remember, respect your intellect.